as part of our cybersecurity series being hosted by the Canadian Food Innovation Network. Mm -hmm. In the first two sessions, we learned how cybersecurity threats in the Canadian food sector can take many forms and how uh, this should be on the radar of all businesses and organizations. In particular, in the second session, we talked about ransomware, which is very timely with recent incidents at Sobeys and Maple Leaf Foods, just to name a few. Today, we're going to focus our attention on how bad actors are targeting business email accounts, otherwise known as business email compromise, or BEC for short. And they're using that to steal funds and critical information from companies. My name is Tyson McGinnis, and I'm the Regional Innovation Director for the Atlantic Region here with uh, CFIN, the Canadian Food Innovation Network. I'm excited to be joined today by Vidya and David, who will be our panelists for today's discussion into this growing cybersecurity threat. Uh, Vidya, uh, as a senior government leader, can you share a bit about your background and your current role with the federal government? Oh, we'll just need you to turn your, uh, you, yes, perfect. Great. I should, un yes. <laughs> yes. So, thank you so much. And so I'm Vidya Shankarayan, and I am the assistant deputy minister responsible for digital data and innovation at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And fundamentally, my role is to, I would say, modernize our agriculture sector, as well as our agri-food sector when it comes to digitization and innovation, as well as to keep us safe. I have spent over 20 years in the government and prior to that in the private sector, mostly in the space of digital and technology. And the fundamental challenge that I have noticed is a lack of awareness when it comes to how digital technologies create cybersecurity vulnerabilities. So maybe I'll leave it there for my intro. Perfect. Thank you, Vidya. And David, can you share us with us a little bit your journey of becoming an entrepreneur in this space? Sure. So I, I've been a cybersecurity professional for about a decade, and it was by accident. I happily was running the website for the University of New Brunswick in uh, the oldest English language university in Canada, and we got hacked by a hacktivist group called Team Digital. And I was one of a half dozen or so folks who got the nasty note from the attackers on a Mother's Day Sunday, read through it, quickly checked out Pastebin, realized it looked legitimate, and raised the flag, uh, raised the alert to my team in, in the IT team of the university and then rolled up my sleeves using experience I had as a former newspaper reporter and as a Canadian Forces soldier to help do what I now call incident response. And that was my Alice in Wonderland-like moment of the rabbit hole of cybersecurity. From that experience at UNB, I realized that cyber is about people, process, and culture more than it ever is about any given technology. And the more that we can educate and motivate people to know more and care more about security, the more effective we are in addressing this risk as quickly and efficiently as possible. I founded Boseron Security in 2017, and we went from five customers uh, in 2017 to now 675 customers, including some of the biggest banks, telecommunications, government agencies you can think of in Canada. Now we're growing into the United States, Europe, and proudly in Africa as well. Uh, so we've got a wealth of experience and, and really excited to talk about today's topic. Wonderful. Thank you to both of you. And uh, David, you're definitely in a growing business, um, which is great for your business. But for all of us in the food industry, we have to look at it from the other side in terms of the threat, of course. And I'm wondering, just to start off with the kind of bigger picture, um, a lot of us have heard of ransomware attacks. They're in the news quite often, um, but quite often business email compromise doesn't quite often make the headlines. Can you share with us how they kind of compare in terms of their impact to business? Sure. From some numbers, like the FBI's report in May of 2022, total global losses due to financial transactions being fraudulently exercised through these uh, manipulative emails can be north of $43 billion in terms of that's what's reported losses to the FBI. And that could be a fraction of the overall total global losses. This is 
the granddaddy of cybercrime. And it is, in, in essence, just the latest iteration of plain old financial fraud, just made easier and faster through the efficiencies of email. Um, and it, it was quite popular before the era of ransomware. And as the cat and mouse game between attackers and defenders with ransomware has ramped up, it's, it's become even more important. And it's impacting in new and clever ways, not just financial transactions, but sometimes the actual shipment of goods. Now, these are highly embarrassing and emotional experiences for the people who are the victims of these fraudsters or, or attackers. Um, and th this is why you don't hear a lot about it, because it can actually have a significant emotional toll. For example, the uh, one of the financial staff at the city of Ottawa was the victim for about a $100,000 uh, business email compromise a few years ago and, and had to actually take a medical leave for a period of time. Um, and it was an incredibly public and traumatic example. And we've seen that in, in all kinds of sectors. The biggest uh, example in Canada to date that we know of was McEwen University, where $11 million was erroneously transferred uh, by a sophisticated cyber criminal group impersonating a known contractor for a $100 million building project that gradually over a period of months built and worked the relationship to extract the funds. So we've seen losses as, as into the tens of thousands of dollars into the millions of dollars. But the impact on each individual organization is highly dependent on the size and scale of your business. You know, what for some would be a, a minor inconvenience for a small, mid-sized business might make the difference between making payroll or not. Right, exactly. And thank you, David. And that's definitely some eye-opening kind of numbers and, and some scary thoughts in terms of what can happen in terms of the risk. I'm wondering, Vidya, if you can kind of tell us a little bit about why, from your perspective, that whole business email compromise side isn't as reported in the news, maybe why it sometimes falls under the radar? Really good question. And first and foremost is it, as David just pointed out, it is actually the easiest of crimes to make happen. And when he spoke about stealing money, I'm gonna to add to it is, unfortunately, business uh, uh, email compromise has been the reason for a number of stealing food crimes that have happened over the last year and continue to happen. And I'm sure I'll get to more details on that as the session progresses. But first and foremost, the reason we don't hear much about it is it's been going on for a long time. So it is not new. Ransomware is fairly new. The I would say the very highly refined and polished cyber attacks that we see now where data poisoning is happening, et cetera, are actually quite new and more sophisticated. The business email compromise is the grandfather of uh, cyber attacks. And first and foremost, it causes embarrassment, significant embarrassment, reputational risk. In fact, I would say reputations are not just risk, reputations are lost. And when you look at the Canadian businesses, so we are a country of about 1.2 million businesses and 98% of our businesses are small businesses, less than 10 people, mostly less than five people running the business. We are a country where we export. Just speaking on the food perspective, we are in the top five exporters of the world. So imagine you report that you have had a business email compromise you are now actually putting your business at risk and at risk from to the 200 countries that our small businesses export to. So we would say reputational risk is number one, embarrassment. And thirdly is also putting yourself out there saying, I've now been compromised once and creating the risks that other business email compromise attacks could actually happen more often to you because you're right away informing saying, you know what, I've been vulnerable and this means that I'm actually not as protected as I should be, or I've not taken as many measures as I should have taken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. So it, this gives us a sense of just how big of an issue it is and, and how complex it is and, and the ramifications on a business and then personally as well in, in terms of stress. I'm um, wondering if you can explain now a little bit more, um, maybe for both of you, um, what's typically involved in one of these scams and what kind of the process is and, and typical strategies or tactics that the uh, criminals take? 
Sure, I'll go first and, and Vidya, appreciate your, your help as well. Um, so oftentimes what we observe with attackers is the first thing they do is they do their homework. They learn about your business, what's available with a Google search, who do you connect with? Maybe they've compromised another business that you do business with, and they're now going to read email chains. They may even recycle real conversations from the past as part of their impersonation to get you to build trust and do other things. So, so the idea that criminals are, are stupid or lazy needs to get dispelled. They are clever and they will work hard to rob you of your money. They just won't work hard enough to get a real job. Um, and so they do their recon and then they set up their premises primarily by email, although there's there's always the use of text messages or phone calls or for the truly bold, there's in person, but that's very, very rare. Most of the time it's by email. And so they'll start a conversation and they'll try and impersonate uh, a key leader. One of the experiences I had when I ran security for the University of New Brunswick, they actually impersonated an executive who was legitimately on vacation and that was known via social media. And, and that was used as a premise. Hey, so-and-so, as you know, I'm on vacation in Europe. We have a time-sensitive transaction. I really need you to get this done. And they use manipulation tactics like authority and timeliness to get that action performed. And they take advantage of a lack of rigor and financial controls to actually execute transfers. Now, this is for the example of... Um, of wire funds, but there, as, as Vijay noted, there are other kinds of, of attacks, and, I, and I'll leave it to her to talk more about the, the food supply misdirection stuff. Uh, on the financial side, there is the all too familiar gift card one. And, and I actually, my company is the target of these on a regular uh, side, and I don't know how to feel about it. I've kind of honored in one sense that they think that they want to take a run at me, and I'm insulted at the other because we literally teach people about these things. But proudly, our employees regularly report Emails from CEO David Shipley at some on, uh, anonymous Gmail account saying, I'm really busy, tied up in Zoom calls all day. Could you please buy a gift cards for our hardworking team and then email me when you're done? So those are just some examples of, of some of the things that, that get done. They do their homework. They learn the players. And, and remember, they try, try again. There's no penalty for them to try and take a shot on goal. They'll take as many shots on goal as it takes to be successful. Because mm -hmm. I, I suppose at the end of the day, there is no risk for them to continue taking more shots on goal. No, exactly. Unless they're a very dumb cyber criminal trying to hack Canadian organizations from within Canada, which is rare, but it happens and is an easy win for the RCMP. They operate outside of jurisdictions that have extradition treaties with Canada uh, to commit these crimes because, you know, they do their homework. Right. Perfect. Um, and I'm wondering maybe as 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 Sifin, you know, with, within uh, the food and beverage industry, um, I'm wondering, um, first of all, can you think of an example that might have taken place um, within with regard to the food industry being victim in this in terms of a BEC? So I can jump in here uh, because uh, I actually have a whole slew of examples. And uh, so First and foremost is as we just, when we started the session, we said is typically people do not report. And that is for a variety of reasons. So in December, the United States Department of Agriculture, they, along with the Food and Drug Administration, actually sent out to all U.S. businesses, especially I'm speaking in the ag sector, with regards to alerts on business email compromise specifically. And this is First and foremost, because of the number of financially damaging criminal incidents that happened in the U.S. just in the last six months. So, of course, we all know that it's a, fundamentally it's about getting money. Now they're starting to steal food because the world is suffering. There is a significant food shortage worldwide. And as David just pointed out, this can be coming from any country. We just don't know where it's coming from. So one example is a sugar exporter in the U.S. received an email from the CFO of a company that they regularly supply their sugar to. However, if on close inspection, when you look at that email, there is, and you have significantly long last names, for example, like mine, is you change one alphabet in that email address, which the 
supplier did not check. They assumed it's their regular, the CFO whom they basically contact and uh, supply sugar to in another country on a monthly basis. They sent over a significantly large shipment to a completely fraudulent entity. And so now they lost their shipment and they, so basically their food was stolen, but they had to still continue shipping to the original, I would say CFO who had actually asked for from the original, uh, the buyer. So what happens here is that they lost out on the shipment. They had to still guarantee the shipment to their original buyer. This is just giving you one example in the sugar industry. It doesn't matter whether it's a sugar industry. I have another one in the fish industry. I have another one in the meat industry. This can happen to any business. And typically they start small. So when David, to your point is that the first one example I have that the USDA gave me was 200,000. Then once they have that, then they go to the next company, it's 500,000. It keeps, it's actually, it constantly, it's not a very small increase. It's, I would say it's a significant increase. They double, they triple, because once they know that they're able to get into the market and they also find different suppliers to go to. So some numbers I'm going to throw out here is fraud in the food industry just in 2022 cost the world $40 billion. And a bulk of it comes from business email compromise because that's the easiest. And when you're dealing with the same supplier, the same buyer, unless you really verify, it's actually the easiest fraud to do. So from a Canadian perspective, yes, the reporting in Canada has been few and far between. So I'm really thankful that we're actually having the session that we have today. I represent the Canadian version of USDA, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. So definitely want to be working close, more and more closely with CFIN in order to not only get the word out, but also to do more. Here in Canada, 11% of our GDP is exporting primary agriculture and agri-food. You can just assume the amount of criminal activity that can be taken up when 11% when of our GDP is in the food industry and we export to 200 countries. That is, I would say, we are the largest sector for exports. So the, the less we ignore and the more we actually be open and speak up about it, let's keep the embarrassment aside. Let's keep the reputational risk aside because the reputational risk would be significantly higher if we actually ignore it. So I shall leave it there. I, I, actually, Vijay raises a really, really important message is that if we don't report the, the, the extent of this crime, particularly back to law enforcement and to government policymakers, we can't get the support we need to get this issue higher on the agenda, um, whether that's through diplomatic efforts, law enforcement efforts, or other efforts that are the purview of the federal government to advance. If they don't have the data, they can't take action. And you know that's what's really important about changing the narrative. If we are losing millions, and there's no reason to believe we're not losing millions, if not tens of millions of dollars per year from Canada into these thieves, uh, we are setting ourselves up for future failure. Because as, as Vijay noted, the, the ransomware industry is very mature. It started off small. It started off with twenty and forty thousand dollar ransoms before they got to seven figure ransoms. So if we ignore the the small fire that might exist right now on Beck and food redirection or wire transfers or gift card frauds, it will accelerate. It'll accelerate fast. Thank you. So I mean, really one of the messages beyond <laughs> that this goes beyond actual financial transactions, but actually stealing food and, and how common that is and being a big, huge issue is that companies do have a duty to report as well, that they really need to do that. Um, in order to protect all of us and so that we can we can get ahead of the uh, criminals as, as much as possible and be able to keep things in check. Um, I'm wondering about beyond the financial side or even the theft of, of food, is there other risks to the supply chain that can happen through these kinds of compromises? I'll jump in there and I'm sure David uh, would have some interesting intel here as well. So the few that come to mind is, so I'm going to take from, again, I'm going to stick to the ag industry. That's my raison d'etre for now. We are in what we call as ag 
4.0, where the pace of, I would say, adoption for digitization and digital technologies has, I mean, I've never seen a pace such as what we have right now, because we need to feed the world. As I said, is we are a population of just about 38 million, and we have 1.2 million businesses in the country, not all ag. I would say ag businesses are about 175,000. And we are in the top five exporters of the world, top five feeders of the world. That just shows you how important Canadian food industry is to feed the world. So Ag 4.0, digital technology has been skyrocketing in its adoption. However, what we have actually significantly lacked in is, along with adopting technology, digitization, supply chain management, having end-to-end -end autonomous technologies, is the awareness of the vulnerabilities and the threats. And this is not because people have been lazy, not at all. People are actually not aware. They are really not aware that there is a significant threat here. So first and foremost is the awareness. Secondly is when they are attacked, many are not aware that they have actually been attacked and whether it is the stealing of food or the second part that we've been seeing more and more is data poisoning. The reason I bring about data poisoning is in the ag supply chain, data poisoning is not only a reputational risk to the Canada brand, it is also a significant risk to our trade and commerce around the world. It is very easy through a single back adding additional data into a supply chain. Basically, when you send a back, hey, the back comes from the wrong email address about a particular product that you're using in your supply chain traceability for, let's just basically take an example of you are a processor, a processor that is processing and making, processing hog products and making sausages. You get an email from one of your suppliers who supply you spices for your sausages and that email basically says that they're using a particular ingredient that is not acceptable in the country that you're exporting to. You don't mm -hmm. look at it because you just assume this is your regular supplier who has been sending you because ingredient list is mandatory. Data poisoning happens, one email, it goes directly into the input and it actually gets onto the labeling of your products. It shows up at the border, or sometimes it actually makes it to the other country and then there's an entire food recall because one item on your list has been poisoned. And this is not the truth. It's actually fake news because this is, it's very easy to do because this is not about actually stealing food from you. This is stopping your supply chain and having an entire supply chain actually being discarded so that another country can take over and provide to basically export their products versus Canadian products. Data poisoning, step one, it disrupts the supply chain, but step two, Canada brand gets impacted significantly. And the particular business that becomes vulnerable to data poisoning, I would say is that they're, in order to rebuild their reputation, rebuild their clientele for export can sometimes take years or even decades because it is a small world when it comes to the food industry. But David, I'm sure, has some other examples to jump in with. Well, yeah, I, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant that you explain the motivation. Like, why would someone mess with our data? And then, you know, at the macroeconomic level, Canada competes against countries and sometimes competes against countries who we are in, in broad geopolitical tensions with. So not only are there business motivations to do this, um, to win the, the 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 business, to get the money into their economy, there are, it, it, there are also motivations to actively harm the Canadian economy. It's not just about their benefit. If they if they can get a, a, a two sided win on this, in certain certain hostile countries will do this to us. And, and and people watching this might think, well, this is the stuff of of movies. It's not realistic. It happens every single day. I can tell you about a story from Nova Scotia where one farmer hacked another farmer's system for distributing the amount of feed to the dairy cows to lower their output so they could take greater market share. It, it happens within Canada. There, In a different context, there are, are criminal cases where U.S. Major League Baseball teams staff hacked the other baseball team to get their recruiting data 
of their players. So just to say like this happens, it's a part of unscrupulous or unethical business. It is a risk to your business to manage. You know, it sends a chill down my spine, but you, the, the story is just so brilliantly evil, right? When you think about, about how important ingredient lists are for food safety and other things and how this could all play out. And, and, and I suspect it's based on true to TV. This has already happened. It will happen again. Mm. Fascinating. It definitely shows that the food industry is probably one of those industries that needs to be the most vigilant around this whole area for sure. I mean, everyone in the economy does, but there's definitely quite a layer of risks involved for for us in the food industry. I'm wondering with the way technologies are evolving and available today, is it any easier or is it in fact maybe more difficult to stop these these types of um, scams or criminal activity now and in the future? Well, you know, I'll, I'll speak to that. In fact, it's it just got a lot harder to spot attacks thanks to the new wave of artificially generated uh, text. Now, it used to be that we could give kind of tells to a impersonation email. Maybe the grammar wouldn't be right or the language or maybe the... the or business efficiency, often the first early adopters for these technologies are criminals. And we've already seen examples from researchers using chat GPT to all bypass its, its, its supposed safeguards to generate really compelling phishing emails. So uh, expected to get worse. And we saw a 61% increase in all forms of email fraud known as phishing uh, in Q4, up about 61%. And, and so we can expect that to get much worse. There is no single technological silver bullet buy X software, buy X security service, implant this firewall or email filter that is 100% going to protect your organization. And any vendor that tells you that is not being, let's just be charitable, accurate. Um, the reality is you have to have a layered defense to this. Part of this starts with educating your team that to, to Vidya's excellent examples. This is a real risk for our business, and this is what it could mean for us. It's really important that we, we teach the why, not just the how to spot it, but why would this actually happen? And most importantly, why should I care about this in my role within the organization? Secondly, it is important to have technology controls to catch the easy ones and do stuff and make it easy for people to report suspicious engagements to your IT team or your IT service provider or others and do something about it. But lastly, something that's completely non-technological, really good, robust financial controls and, and implementing those processes of double checking, cross-referencing and challenging and having a culture of challenging when something seems off. That's really important. And that's that's as important, if not more important, than the technology changes. So, you know, set a material amount for your business. If 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 losing five thousand to a fraud would materially harm your business, make sure you have a non-email based way of actually making sure this is the transaction, whether that's a, a video call a chat, a, a telephone call, get it off of that original communications methodology and assume you need to double check. Well, let me, David, I'll jump in with a couple of additional examples. I, I, I really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Is So Canadian businesses, again, sticking to, I would say, is that within our uh, country here is most of them being small. The fundamental challenge they have is the CEO is also the COO, as well as actually, if I take the farm community, is also driving the combines and collecting the, uh, I would say, the lentils. And uh, most probably it's their brother who is actually uh, loading up the trucks. Because we're talking about, you know, the citizen, the ag industry, about 175,000 ag, primary agriculture and food processing included. So it's not, the, the, the number is small and it's usually family-owned small businesses. Technology adoption has skyrocketed and demographics play a big role here. Is when you're looking at the agriculture community, the demographics are typically the 50 plus age group demographics, the knowledge and awareness of not only just technology, but the criminal activity happening from a cybersecurity perspective is typically lower because they, did, they were not born with this technology and they've not grown up with this much, I would say, technology adoption, but also understanding of how 
it can be used in a negative context. So that is with regards to the demographics. But on the other hand, people also, in most cases, our, when I say people, I mean our business owners, don't know where to go for the real information because there's a lot of fake news out there. When you are in the communities all over the country, you're not working you know, at the University of New Brunswick or for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, where you have a CIO, where you have a head of cybersecurity. You're a small business in a remote community and you are part of feeding the world. I visited a few of them and they are shipping to all over the world. So on one hand, I'm a very proud Canadian. I was like, wow, we're in the top five. This is big for us. But on the other hand, really worried but i have some tips so and these are some of the items that we will be uh, passing on through cfin so that uh, the members would be able to get more information but there are some programs that are available through the government where you could actually hire a consultant a cybersecurity consultant in order to even understand how well are you protected not just from ransomware but also how well are you protected with regards to your supply chain how are you verifying? To David's point, is it is it just by through email verification? What are the different layers that you've actually put in there with regard to just like when you're locking your front door to your house or to your, uh, I would say to your business, the same way, how do you actually have the locking systems for your technology and for your supply chain management? There are also community organizations that have now come up with regards to helping Canadian businesses and how can you reach out to the community organizations who may not be situated in your remote location, but perhaps they can actually support you even, I would say, remotely in order to get you up and running. So would like to provide some of that information via CFIN so that our business community can, uh, can avail of them. And I really have to re-emphasize this is that Beck is the most damaging because it is the easiest to make happen. And whether it's stealing money, stealing food, poisoning data, poisoning supply chains, the end result can be extremely damaging. And the more we speak about it and also actually report it. So David, you had a thank you for your uh, part over there in, uh, I would say, increasing the awareness as to why it is important to report. Because the more we report, the more we can actually find ways in order to curtail it even before it actually happens. Absolutely. And, and I just want to add the, uh, as we become more dependent on the internet of things, as Vidya has mentioned, you know, we have to look at how we do maintenance on these technological systems, the same way that we have to do routine maintenance to all the equipment we depend on for either food harvesting or food uh, production. It Make it part of a routine. You know, some of the things that I educate folks about around the world is it can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. What do you own for IT equipment? When was the last time someone checked if it was updated or if there was an update needed? And you can build it on a monthly or quarterly cycle and build it into how you work. If you build security into how you choose what technologies you're going to buy and how you're going to securely use and maintain them, that'll have a big reduction in your risk. And, and nowadays, it's never been more important to, to protect yourselves. And we're talking about business email compromise, which can often be the starting point, as, as Vidya's noted, to a variety of different attacks. But once I can get into your environment for phishing, I can steal from you. I can try and disable your equipment. I can gather competitive information. And it's going to happen. It's not unrealistic. And the most important thing you can do is tell people when it happens. Engage um, folks like your, your local police or the Canadian Center for Cybersecurity to get advice or help dealing with this. You're, you're not alone. Criminals will want you to think you're all on your own and this is your fault and, and all of that emotional turmoil. You're not. You're part of a community, a small but mighty. And I've learned a lot on today's call about just how mighty our ag sector is. Um, but you're not alone and you can get help. And I'm so glad that CFIN is doing this series and providing these resources because at the end of the day, we all depend on you here in Canada and we depend on you not only for our economic prosperity, but also you're our food suppliers as well. Thank you. Thank you to you both. And, and I'm wondering, based on 
one of the last uh, previous comments also spoke to about how large of an exporter we are in Canada. And you've also mentioned about how these are global losses um, in terms of uh, attacks. I'm wondering where Canada stands in terms of being a list of a target for, for these kind of criminal activities. We, we know from the StatsCan survey, uh, about $600 million was lost last year. That's up 50% from 2019 or about $400 million. That's losses to all forms of cybercrime. As Vigi noted, ransomware gets a lot of the attention and a lot of the cash. Uh, but Beck is a huge part of that story. But you don't see the full spectrum of the losses of Beck reflected in that because this is what businesses are willing to admit to. Um, so that 50% increase is just in what people are admitting to on surveys to police forces. That's not the total scope of the damages. And just to jump in there, I, I fully agree with you, David. And so with regards to where we are on the target list, so as I said is we are very well known around the world that we are in the top five food suppliers to the world. We are in number three. We are behind US and UK. So we are number three out of five. And this is not a number that we should be happy about because this is a number that we should be very unhappy about. We are just about 175,000 businesses when it comes to the primary agriculture and the processing. And we are number three in the world when it comes to our being vulnerable and being attacked. And to David's point, there is when it comes to Beck, there is very little reporting. Even when it comes to ransomware, although there is more awareness and there's a little bit more reporting on that front, is now recently public safety has issued the basically it's by law for all federally regulated businesses to be reporting when they are when they are actually compromised through cyber attacks. And I know that when you're a small business, as I mentioned, is you could just be a two-person business and reporting and then providing all that information to your local police, to the RCMP, to Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity, this can seem as a significant burden because you're already losing. You, just as I gave the example of the sugar uh, exporter here in the US, it started with a 200,000 loss and it became 500,000 because they did not even catch it quick enough because they, they became vulnerable multiple times just through different one of these, I would say, um, back, uh, back attacks, that's what I call them. It's at our end, the, the less we talk about it, the more it happens, but also there are certain countries that are actually, I would say, there's more activity from certain countries. So in order to help our Canadian Center for Cybersecurity, Public Safety, and the RCMP, the more we can support them with the, with the data and information, including Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, that is basically my organization, the more you can help as businesses, the more we can also then do for you with regard to protecting. Excellent. And, and I'm wondering, you've provided a few tips along the way here today, which has been excellent about what companies can do to protect themselves. But I think it's always good to reinforce that. So in summary, as a company, what can you really do to reduce your risk of falling victim to one of these attacks? Sure. And I'll, I'll start off with my, my top three. So number one, any online services that you're using today, particularly if you're using things like Google or Microsoft for your email provision, turn on multi-factor authentication. And, and if you can, turn on what's known as number matching. So you actually have to have your phone, see the number and input into the app. And it, that is, that's going to cut down your risk from brute force attacks. That is people just guessing what your username and password is by 99%. I just want to repeat that by 99%. It's not perfect, but wow, does that reduce an incredibly automated attack. Secondly, educating yourself and, and your team, no matter how small you are, that these are kinds of attacks are going to happen and they're going to arrive a lot of times by email. So slow down, be conscious, think about it, be skeptical and have those resilient processes for doing things. And number three, when something bad happens, tell somebody about it so they can get better better advice. Those are the quick three things you can do. There are many uh, more detailed frameworks that will scale depending on the size of your business and look to groups like CFIN for the latest information, best practices, Ag Canada 
for what's happening in the big picture, because the big picture is going to be the forecast for this year. I've never seen cyber more busy than that. And we're only, we're two weeks into the year and I have never seen it like this. So make this the year that you get up to date, stay up to date and, and stay informed. Perfect. And I'll just jump in here, uh, David. Actually, I really like your three points. I'm just going to add a little bit to each of the points. And the first and foremost, I would say is when you've had, when you've been compromised, it's very emotional. Because apart from losing money, it's losing your reputation. And you almost are in disbelief that, oh my God, I never thought it was going to happen to me. And that emotional part is, I mean, I would say is that in 2023, we literally have to start expecting that it's, this can happen to any of us. It is not because in particular you were vulnerable because of a very particular reason. It's everyone, we are all vulnerable. David, to your point, we're two weeks into the, uh, into the new year. And this is, I would say, the number one risk in the world is on the cybersecurity front. It is emotional. It is a very tough time because on one hand, it's sometimes you're right. It's not a ransomware attack for millions and millions of dollars. It may be a hundred thousand. It may be a $50,000 back. It may be a $10,000. It is important to report because it's not just the amount, the, the money that actually is the factor here. It is to ensure that lawmakers and protectors are able to actually get to the root and avoid this from happening in the future. Second part, David spoke about the multi-factor authentication. I'm going to add to that saying, many of you may not know how to make that happen for your own business. So getting a security plan in place, just as you know, when you go to the bank and you get your banking stuff in place, the same way, getting in a cybersecurity consultant and get and actually Setting up a plan, it may be the simplest of plans, depending on how big your business is. It could be, I would say, a more complex plan. And this is where there are some funding mechanisms for small businesses to request from the government in order to seek some funding to get a cybersecurity consultant who has been pre-approved to have the credentials to be able to support you. And we definitely want to ensure that we provide that information to CFIN so that you do know that you are getting real news and not the fake news, I would say. And last but not least, when it comes to the third point, I would say, so I'm going to give you an example. So recently I was visiting a, I would say a medium size processing plant in the country who had about 50 employees. So I would call it a medium sized business exporting to Asia Pacific region one of their equipments stopped working while I was there. They were end-to-end -end automated. And they said, oh, don't worry. Our supply, basically our technology provider is in Germany. They are just going to fix it remotely. I said, great, I said, I'm just curious to know about how your cybersecurity plan is because I said, it's everything here is automated, including all of their data because they have end-to-end -end traceability for their supply chain. Wow. The, the, the spices information, came from that, uh, from that example. And they said, oh, don't you worry, we're not connected to the internet. I said, you just told me that your technology provider is going to remotely fix your equipment from Europe. I'm not saying a technology provider is going to hack you, not at all. But I said, you are fully exposed to the internet because that is how your technology provider is coming in. This was, um, apart from being an aha moment, of course, I have really scared them because they didn't realize that they were vulnerable. And this is a multi, multi-million dollar production facility. Now, they are not even sure if they have actually been attacked. So what happens is there's also this awareness perspective where if you're not even aware, sometimes you actually become aware months later. So, and the reason I mentioned this example is because for all of you listening is it is really time to be looking at, you know, I think David already spoke about, take a look at what, what technologies do you actually own? And then take a look at how are you actually protecting them? Feel free to ask all the questions. No question is a dumb question. Don't think, oh my God, I'm going to be seen as I really know nothing about technology. Trust me, that's where I started. That's where I'm sure David started. 
is no question is a dumb question. Ask those questions, seek help. And of course, through, I would say, reputable as well, organizations such as the CFIN, because there's a lot of, I would say, fraud and fake news. Ask those questions and start getting protected right away because we want to, we want to fight the cyber criminals so that we can actually continue feeding the world. Excellent. Those are great insights. And, uh, and definitely uh, thank you to both of you today. This has been, this has been wonderful. I think for all of our viewers, myself included, for sure, it's been a bit of an eye opener uh, today. We definitely, we learned just how big of an issue, you know, business, uh, email compromise can be in the hundreds of millions of dollars here in Canada, that it's rapidly growing, that some of these phishing scams went up growing 60% plus in the last quarter, that Canada is uh, the third top ranked target for these types of attacks. So that's definitely scary as well. Um, we're also made aware that we we are bound and, and to, to report these types of activities when they happen. And although they're emotionally um, and financially, obviously, you know, a major issue that it's important to do so. And um, we also learned that the threats can be beyond financial, that it also can be poisoning of data and your reputation risk as well, or, or even stealing of food products. Um, and as well, we also learned that, you know, through technology, AI capabilities, et cetera, we're increasingly blurring the lines between being able to detect these types of scams um, moving forward. So there's definitely a lot of food for thought there for people to be concerned about. But I guess on the positive front, we have people like yourselves um, working in government and in business, um, taking leadership roles and helping make us aware of this. So we definitely appreciate um, your roles and, and dedication to doing that. And I think we also were made aware of things we can all do as companies and organizations to reduce our risk. And on that note, um, I guess in closing, I want to mention that we're very happy to partner with both Saron and uh, CFIN in terms of offering members access to their security awareness training. There's a bit of a preferred offering that's available, so you can reach out to us for that. And as well as was referenced today during our session, um, afterwards we'll be sharing some additional resources and information that uh, members and viewers can see to uh, get themselves more aware and uh, aware of what to do next in terms of uh, uh, addressing this issue in your own company. So thank you to you both for attending today and thank you to everyone and um, have a great day. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.